I prepared that, so I thought I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll talk about securing connections for defending telco workloads in the cloud era. So primarily, before diving into the topic, a bit about myself. I'm Barunacharya. I go by Demon1024 over the internet, over Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you want me to uh, look for. I'm a maintainer and I lead the development for Cubearmor, which is a CNCF sandbox project. I work as a software engineer at Acunox and I'm actively mentoring over Google Summer of Code and Linux Foundation mentorship. Also, I'm a proud CNCF ambassador. So what to expect out of this call, to talk? We, it's been a long day. We have been digesting a lot of information. So I just want to give you some context about what more you are going to learn today. So primarily two things. What kind of attack vectors are there for 5G and tel telco workloads and how you can prevent them? But the, that's one of the things. The other thing is how do you orchestrate this security against these attack vectors? Because telco workloads are dynamic in nature. You are creating clusters. There are multiple clusters you manage across I don't know how many regions. So orchestrating is also an important aspect. So we are going to dive deep into both of them. Uh, how many of you in folks know about Nephew? Nephew is a Linux Foundation networking project. That's good to see. So I'm going to base my entire talk about uh, around workloads running on Nephew. Uh, Nephew is uh, a Kubernetes uh, orchestration where it helps you do telco domain automation in, in an intent-driven way. It manages a lot of infrastructure and has a lot of design considerations around automating actual tel telco uh, workloads. Uh, the, dem the demo application today will be free 5GC. Uh, it's a standard demo application used across Nephew as well as other 5G telco, uh, telco demos. So I thought I'd use that. Uh, the free 5GC deployment contains a management cluster, some regional clusters, some edge clusters orchestrated across control plane and worker planes. So, how do you enforce security on that? We have maybe hundreds of tools in the CNCF security landscape. Do I just start using everything? But uh, before trying to decide on what exactly to use, I'm going to take one tool from that, CubeArmor. You, you might have already predicted that being I'm part of CubeArmor. So I'm going to use CubeArmor to showcase some of the attack vectors and prevention of those attacks inside this Nephew plus free 5GC demo scenario. We are going to see how to observe things through CubeArmor, how to secure endpoints, how to actually harden your infrastructure with that. So in our free 5GC deployment, we have network functions like uh, NRF, UDM, PCF, WebUI. All these network functions live inside our free 5GC deployment. I'll take one of them being WebUI. WebUI is a user-facing uh, uh, tool helping you registration and subscription of various edge-related uh, uh, things. And let's see maybe WebUI in action. So uh, this is how WebUI works about. You can register user and devices. You can manage subscriptions and a lot of things around that. But essentially, it's a user-facing application. If, if, you provide, if you find a vulnerability in that, you can probably start laterally moving around the entire infrastructure because at the end, web UI, even if it's behind a password, it's interacting with the rest of the 5G control plane stack that we have. So it's important to start securing that. Okay. So, this is the visibility we gain. Uh, I, have, I have created this from Q, the information that we get from CubeArmor, that what's happening inside the WebUI application. We can see that WebUI tries to access its own configuration file. It has access to the DNS resolvers. It is trying to communicate with uh, MongoDB, which, uh, which, is, which it uses for database. So if somehow some attacker sneaks into WebUI, it gains a lot of accesses. So 
the demo attack scenario is we have a con uh, we imagine that web ui is compromised and turn rogue uh, so what can it do it can interact with a fellow network function called network repository function where which actually can provide with all the endpoint details of rest of the network functions available so you don't want that happening because now it can not only fetch the information but it knows what to maybe try to exploit next and start moving around so how do you prevent this we have a zero trust policy that i have personally created based on information that we saw here that okay web console needs to do so and so things what all things so uh, if you see here there's a policy saying allow tcp udp raw for the free 5gc web console binary so even if an attacker now sneaks into your web ui workload the attacker itself cannot do anything it the it's the only it's the web ui only that can do things so from a demo perspective i i invite my friend barun again to show you the demo so we have a we have applied this policy i have executed into the web ui pod and we try to use wget to access the nrf uh, endpoints and as soon as i try to access that i can gain uh, information about udm which is another network function so i can knit together this information and probably start uh, looking into that but uh, what i'm going to do now is i'm going to apply this policy we we uh, we create this policy to block uh, like this is this is a policy to block tcp udp for other binaries inside that pod so now if i try to exec into that and as soon as i try to double get it says me bad address because it does not have access to udp itself so it cannot resolve that dns but even if i ax try to access through like standard ip cider it won't be able to do that because we don't have tcp access as well and you get a alert uh, around uh, what happened in inside that pod so what next is that there are a couple of attack vectors here Uh, through we already took so these attack vectors are i'm not crafting them uh, miter fight has a list of attack vectors that they have compiled which are relevant for 5g today both miter and nisa have published this attack vectors it's live on their website you can visit fighter uh, fight.miter.org and you can check out what kind of attack vectors are there and but essentially we are i'm just taking that ex as an example of possible exploitations uh, at the end if you have a zero trust policy you can probably have them you have your workload secure against uh, any future possible attack vectors as well so similarly there's another uh, tactic called uh, registration of malicious network function with 5007 but it it uses the same principle under the hood it you are going to use a rogue nf to inter start interacting with the uh, network repository function and we already try to say, we are already secure against that so so we already saw that okay inside the web ui web ui binary we saw that okay web console binary is still able to access all the entities but the malicious actor is not able to do anything <laughs> but some other uh, concerns could be but uh, it's not just about securing entities inside your pod you need you need to have multi layer security you need to have security on your uh, services itself like they they communicate over tls or not uh, so this is a report uh, it's a demo application so it's obvious that it's using plain text but ideal case in your production environment you need to look for these things that okay you are using tls you have network policies around and what not because uh, if somehow someone attackers are always looking for loopholes they 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 can try to sneak inside anything uh one last example from uh from the attack perspective is that uh, gnode b component manipulation so gnode b is responsible for managing your user and devices and what you can probably do is what if someone ins is inside the gnode b pod they change their uh, configuration that okay 
uh, they change the network slices or the number of UEs it can register. A lot of configuration goes into that. So what if you can do that? So I'm going to play this. So I have an access to a sample. Uh, this is the same free 5GC deployment. And what I'm going to do is now try to access the GNODE B configuration file using cat right now. So I, I've already applied the policy. So even if I try to start, uh, so it's called, it was not called config.yml. So I, as an attacker, tried to look into what is exactly the configuration called. But as soon as I try to do that, you see that it was permission denied. So it's important that uh, we secure these configuration files and data points so that uh, it's not, you are not able to modify it. As well as it's important that a normal, so there's an, an, an RCLI helper around here, which, which will see that, okay, it can still access the configuration file and report you that, okay, this is the configuration details. So that's how, that's what the, what we, what the model is about. We, uh, we can enforce security that, okay, we can allow what is supposed to happen and you can set what is not supposed to happen. We, we, we look at it pers uh, from a file perspective as well as a network perspective. But now you might say that, do I keep writing these policies on my own? That's not something I would like, right? We have a lot of dynamic workloads. And if, so I showcased all of the demo scenarios using Cube Armor as a project. But what if you don't have Cube Armor on one of your uh, clusters, or you, for some reason, you cannot orchestrate Cube Armor onto your clusters. You maybe have some different tooling altogether. So how would you go about that? Today, uh, as a general perspective, you, what you try to do is you identify security engines, you create policies around those security engines, and there are ch challenges, right? What if you want to, like, you are, you are probably using Cilium today. What if you want to ma move to Calico tomorrow? You would need to you might say, okay, I was just using Kubernetes network policy. That's a standard policy. But pol that kind of policy does not have, uh, like, Q there are certain things that Cilium policy has more, more advanced than standard network policy. And you would want those kind of features as well. So how would this migration affect that? Do I keep all of this in mind? Uh, and uh, what if my workloads are dynamically created? So there are a lot of things to think about here. So Nephew has been talking about intent-driven approach to telco automation. What if we bring the same concept to security as well? What if I, as a user, can just define that, okay, what is supposed to happen, rather than defining how it is supposed to happen? I do not say that, okay, it's a Calico, uh, it's a Cilium policy or an, a Calico policy. I just say that deny UDP access or deny, uh, like, uh, I, want my, I want to prevent DNS manipulation altogether. That's the intent I define. I don't have to worry about uh, there would be, if it's going to be a Cilium, Multa CNI, Calico, I don't know what more CNIs do you have. Or uh, from a runtime perspective, whether you have Cube Armor, Falco, Tetragon, I don't know uh, how many kinds of <coughs> runtime security you have. So what could be an intent here? You could say probably do not allow privilege escalation. Now this could be, it's not just about choosing which tool, it's not about either or, or problem. It is possible that the same intent could be used by multiple security engines out there, and you need security at both the levels. So something like uh, do not allow privilege escalation, you would probably have an admission controller policy saying do not admit pods with CAPSIS admin. Okay, but what if you are inside a pod and you break out and have start a, having a capsis admin you can probably define a cube armor policy saying deny capsis admin inside so and so so you need to cover all your bases when it comes to security but how do you do that uh, this is a high level approach towards what we have been working towards for intent driven security it's it borrows concept from the pvc pv model that you have uh, you create a security intent, you have a security intent binding, and then the security intent binding is watched by an operator, which then, based on policy engines like Cube Armor, Cilium, 
Kaivan, no OPA, whatever policy you have, there will be adapters to look at that and translate and recommend your policy depending on your security intent. So now demo for that. The project that we have named it is called Nimbus, and <clears throat> I'll talk more about how to look at that and tie it out. Uh, but essentially, as a user, you create a security intent, and your security operator, which is Nimbus here, watches that security intent. Okay, that was too quick. And your workloads, and then your workloads, and uh, okay, sorry. So your workload, then it watches for your workloads, matches that security intent with the security intent binding, and accordingly generates the final set of recommendation policies based on your workloads there. Let's see it in live action. So what we do is we have a sample application. We are trying to protect Nginx here. And we have QBarmer as well as Nimbus as well as our network policy agent running. Uh, what we are going to do is we are going to create a security intent saying do not allow package management tools, do not allow <coughs> maybe service account token, and do not allow DNS manipulation altogether. So these are the three intents that we are going towards. But uh, now we need we create a binding saying that okay, I want all these three of these three intents applied to my engine export. So I create this security intent to security intent binding map binding mapping. And once those are created, I'll, I'll, uh, what Nimbus is going to do is it will try to analyze. It will see that, OK, uh, whether QBarmer is available or network policies are available. And it will start uh, showcasing your policies according to that. So. For example, we had three security intents, a single security intent binding. It created an intermediary resource, but at the end, you have QBarmer policy as well as network policy generated for you. So to start with, we are going to see that uh, <coughs> we'll explore the software. Uh, do, do, we do not want to apply package management execution in our production containers. That's something you do not want. You do not want someone running app install in our production environment, right? That's that's a too, too much of a risk to handle. So, it created a policy saying, OK, these are all the package management list, and <coughs> it, it will deny that. But uh, and we are going to try to violate that, I guess. Yeah, uh, we go into that pod, and now that, that this policy has been applied by Nimbus, um, uh, as soon as I try to execute the mm, any any package management it it is going to permission deny and again the again all the same information again but uh, but something like dns is something that both qbarmer and network policy need to handle it's not something <coughs> that is that should be limited to uh, like you need to handle that at both layers so for as you can see for dns manipulation we created both a network policy as well as a qbarmer policy according to what we deem fit and it's being applied so that's how nimbus operates it 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 uh, it has both uh, it it checks what all engines are available and accordingly create policies towards that so that's that's what uh, i've been talking about uh, as as to what you could have taken away from the stock we have a 5g control pane it has a lot of attack vectors. You are deploying a lot of workloads in a very dynamic manner. So there's a need to isolate individual workloads and then have security on that. Zero Trust can probably help you out. But for Zero Trust, you need that observability as well to understand <coughs> what's happening inside your containers and accordingly harden, start hardening my X application, network functions, and workloads. And finally, we because these workloads are so dynamic in nature, you never know what kind of policies or what kind of engines to expect for. And uh, you could probably, you we can probably take the same intent-driven approach that Nephew has towards security as well to handle the dynamic nature of 5G. So yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a QR code for QBarmer. You can check out the QBarmer project. 
if you want to know more about the Nimbus project, it's still in works, but uh, we all of this that I told uh, is being part being made as part of 5gsec.com. And yeah, that's all. If you if you are around tomorrow, today the, already the booths are closed. So I'll be available at the Cube Armor booth as well as the Aquinox booth. These are the number in the solution showcase. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Oh yeah, you have a question? Okay, I can I cannot hear you. Can someone give him a mic? How does this enhance to have uh other than the Kubernetes network policy and uh, port security policies, PSPs, other than the intent-driven architecture? So, there were two aspects there. So like uh, uh, network policies themselves, so part of the reason people try to go towards certain agents is that the standard policies are not enough. Like network policy, you can apply a network policy, but then you need the visibility into when the policy is being violated, right? Normal standard QProxy does not support that visibility. You need Cilium maybe or Calico or enterprise version to gain that visibility. Uh, from from a other perspective, I guess the runtime perspective, uh, network policies only enforce upon port to port security, right? what happens inside the pod. So as I showed, you probably know that web UI should be able to access NRF, right? But you never get to know that web UI has been compromised. Now, whether it's web UI accessing the NRF or is it the compromised malicious actor trying to access NRF? And that's where runtime security comes in the picture. And you have Cubarmon to help you with that. Uh, PSPs themselves are restricting. So with PSPs, as a P, it's not PSPs anymore, it's a port security admission, uh, you you create policies for what, at admission layer, right? Uh, what happens after admission has done, you never know if an attacker has sneaked in or not. All, or or it, you can only prevent against attacks that have not happened. What, uh, like, something like log4j, which happened. It was an attack from an actual production application, log4j, where you can now do remote code execution from log4j. But if you had defined a policy at runtime saying that my Java application is only supposed to do so and so things, as soon as it try to execute bash or anything like that, you know that it should have been denied. And with these kinds of approaches, you can do that. Does that help? Yeah. Sure, thank you. Any more questions? No? Nope. So that's my QR code. Uh, if you have any feedback towards my session, I would glad to have that. Thank you. <laughs>